Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, of course, especially uh, Jan Fassbender, who invited me to uh, this workshop. I'm not a complexity expert. I'm a medical doctor by training, but I'm a medical doctor and molecular biologist by training. So I think it is completely different with all of the five speakers that previously spoken. Uh, surrounded by complexity experts here, I would like to present part of our work who will be covered by my talk, which is entitled Complexity and Biosecurity, uh, Molecular Detection of Emerging Threats. Judges from the title, you might expect to hear completely different presentation. This might be about my work, so it is about uh, research or activities that we have done at the Ekman Institute. In the 21st century, I think in the morning, 21st century is the century of complexity. But I could say that 21st century is also the century of fear. That's after started actually with the, of course, the bombing of 9-11, uh, followed by all of the disaster that not naturally uh, happened. We live in an area of rapid connectivity, interdependence, and shared vulnerability of globalization. I think we all agree here that it is a challenge in the multidisciplinary field of interest to the global community, governance, private industry, scientists, and uh, also uh, individuals. I work, as I mentioned, I work at the Airbus Institute uh, in Jakarta. Our mission at the Institute is to advance fundamental knowledge in the field of molecular cell biology and to apply such knowledge to the understanding, prevention, and treatment of human diseases. So I think it is uh, not too far from the mission that what I'm going to present here is uh, part of the activity in the Institute which focus on medical problems in the country. We have focused, as I mentioned, on endemic diseases as well as emerging infectious diseases from two different sides. So it is the host and the pathogen both that could not be separated. And we take advantage of the huge human genetic resource of Indonesia, as reflected by its many ethnic populations. We have 700 languages. As the basis for disease gene discovery with medical and biotechnical, uh, biotechnological application. What we are doing at the ECWAN is a strategic research that could be applied for humanities or people welfare. So as part of the year of terrorism after 9-11 and suicide bombings in Indonesia, we have developed forensic DNA facilities that not used only for human identification, but also for white life and endangered uh, animals in Indonesia. We are working with population markers that has been used to study the population structure of Indonesia that could be applied straight away to the barcoding speciation for most animals, uh, part of the conservation uh, approach. I would like to show this slide since I would like to emphasize that Indonesia has problems with 
emerging and re-emerging diseases. And that's most caused by environmental, ecological, or demographic factors spread by travel and trade. Indonesia is a maritime country. I mentioned about we have 700 languages, meaning 700 uh, genetic background might be. We have 33 provinces and more, more than 220 million. Being diverse, meaning that we have diverse genetic background that lead us to the difficulty and managing disease in Indonesia. Here I would like to share with you the endemic diseases which uh, we face. Malaria is the, we have the highest case number and fatality rate in the world. This is this one. And we also have increasing drug resistant parasites in the country. Tuberculosis, rank surge, and TB burden following India to China. TB is the third major causes of mortality in Indonesia. We have increased drug resistance as well. Dengue, although it is uh, increasing, but the mortality rate is actually decreasing, maybe due to the management of the disease. Hepatitis B is endemic. Avian flu we have the highest case number and fatality rate. So it is not only with globalization and people movement, not only birds that can spread the flu. You have to see this. This is the world without borders. Viruses can be taken in hours to another continent, as shown here. This is a uh, air traffic global. So you can see that how uh, red the, the disease can be spread to another continent in a couple of hours. Before I can continue my talk, because my talk uh, title is uh, Complexity and Biosecurity, let me introduce you to the terminology. What is biosafety and what is biosecurity? Because we have to, maybe we have to uh, synchronize uh, whether the definition for us is the same. Biosecurity terminology are relatively new in the region, especially in Indonesia. We have not, we haven't been actually exposed to their terminology not until the introduction of anthrax powder, because it's in the media. So we know that uh, anthrax powder has been used as a bioterrorism tool. And from there on, uh, Indonesia, <coughs> which suffer also on the terrorism, but not bioterrorism, understand those kind of terminology. Biosecurity encompasses minimizing risk through biological harm, not least being the economic impact. And I think, if you know about the biosafety, biosecurity, then we know that early detection system is very important. And also monitoring uh, is necessary. This one is the biological risk spectrum. So we could divide into three, whether it is natural infection, accidental, or intentional. Biosafety covered the outbreak, epidemic, pandemic, natural, to the accidental. Accidental is kind of like laboratory acquired infection because we are not really working with good laboratory practice, say for example. Or containment failure because the lab was not actually being um, refused and negligence. It's not because uh, you don't know that it's because you don't care whether it is actually safe or not. Intentional is sabotage, biocriminal, and bioterrorism. Those kind of things that uh, the terminology actually divided into. <coughs> WHO 
have set a limited definition. Biosecurity meaning protection, control, accountability for valuable biological materials within laboratories in order to prevent their unauthorized access. So meaning that to prevent those biological materials for not being misused by other people, which is not actually uh, a myth. And biosecurity is the objective of the whole range of policy, <coughs> mechanism, regulation, initiative, biodefense, national implementation of biological weapon convention, many, many things. So biosecurity is more complex. And here, as a life science researcher, I would like to emphasize the importance of responsible life science research in terms of biosecurity to reduce the bio uh, risk. You need a complex and good management. Since uh, one of the biosecurity that are being mentioned here, I have to focus on the molecular detection of emerging threats. How are we going to actually prevent or how are we going to uh, work on the biosecurity? There are several DNA fingerprints or DNA barcodes <coughs> for biosecurity. It's a molecular diagnostic tool. You use DNA uh, for rapid and accurate identification of morphological in this thing, alien species. Alien species meaning anything any microorganism or any uh, organism. And if we use information within a single gene region, I'm not going to teach you on uh, molecular biology, but I think this is uh, also important. We use a single gene region common across all taxa. So you can use this to actually uh, detect many uh, organisms and to access that information by DNA sequencing. You see the a sequence of the DNA. And because it is so simple, it is efficient, so it could provide standardization in every laboratory. You can use that. And uh, uh, which is lacking in international biosecurity community. So molecular diagnostic tools for a speciation uh, is actually can use in several laboratories. Here, this is the one that I would like to share with you. Hatari meaning danger in Swahili. Expressing the impact of environmental change affecting our lives. <coughs> the model that I show here is uh, about uh, one of the white lives. Um, this is elephant. And how are we going to mitigate emerging infectious pathogens of white life? Since uh, what we are now is uh, to provide uh, one health for animal and from human part. I would like to take you to Sumatra. The island of Sumatra is famous with elephant, with tiger, those are critically endangered species due to many things that I think you should know already. So this, uh, this one, this is only part that I'll take you to see. The pesonilo part, the red one is the um, protected area that the elephant actually could use. I could a home of the elephant. It's a long road to the protected area full of palm oil plantation. Along the way, kilometers. Here, I would like to show you what happened to that island from 1985 to, oops, to 2007. The green one is 
the forest cover remaining. It came from 1995 to 2007. 2007, you can see the red uh, color, meaning that you lose that. On the right side also, you can see that that's the pitted remaining area. August 2011, elephant's habitat replaced, deforestation happened. Where do the wildlife live now? I want to show you this. Population estimate in Rio from 1995, when we have that uh, satellite picture. Estimated population from more than 1,000 to 200. Average annual population loss, almost the same. So how we actually could participate to, to the conservation? We use the molecular diagnostic tool to use and using non-invasive uh, approach, meaning that we don't take the blood, but we take the fecal. We analyze 108 samples so far. Uh, we analyzed 250 fecal samples, and we found that uh, about 108 uh, individuals, 64 female, 19 male. That's in Pesonilo, the place. So it is about 100 already in that place. We have plenty play, uh, area, right? In Bukit Tigapulo, which is not really that far from there, but separated by mountainous area, we found 101 individuals. In the southern part of Sumatra, we found 139 individuals. So in total, we already have about 340 individuals. That's through DNA. Of course, what we, we would like to know that whether the individuals came from the similar uh, parents for conservation purposes. So this exercise is actually the best practice for the extraction of genetic analysis of DNA from dung samples. We use genetic markers, we use <coughs> capture, recapture analysis, and from there we could estimate the population size. size. And that population size could be the scientific basis for conservation purposes. All of the media. The media always know and first before the authority. So we are actually following what uh, news from there. Wild Sumatran elephants, like the poison, Java and rhino, also the latest was orangutan was also uh, killed in the plantation area because they are listed as pests, as caterpillar, as others as a um, how many of them left now so here i show you that a gajah is a pest this is a bulletin from one of the palm oil uh, plantation uh, here at the bottom uh, elephant is pest with uh, red termite and everything so we know that exploitation of forest area without respect reduces the size of natural habitat. Here, Sumatran orangutan is critically endangered, but Bornean is critically endangered, meaning it's almost gone. A Bornean is endangered. How to study the Bornean? From Sumatra, we go to Borneo. 
I would like to take you to all of those orangutan places. The Borneo orangutan is divided into three sub uh, species, with habitat in Sarawak, West Kalimantan, Central Kalimantan South, and uh, different with the East Kalimantan. So we could actually identify subspecies of them. Why should we do that? It's for conservation purposes. Because we will release them to their natural habitat. To be able to release them, you have to identify whether they fit with that for conservation purposes. You cannot actually release uh, an individual with different genetic background for conservation. So rehabilitation or reintroduction of orangutan need a specific attention related to genetics, health, behavioral contamination, and also geography. Here we actually studied already nine, 100 uh, individuals, orangutan individuals, that we will release them to the natural habitat by doing the genetic analysis. But uh, if we are talking about biosecurity, we are talking about the deforestation, we are talking also about disease that can actually jump from one host to another. This is the approach that we use, this is a barcode as well, to see a different kind of species of malaria parasite. There are several, there are about six malaria parasites. So the Asian malaria parasite shouldn't actually infect humans. They should infect birds. Human malaria parasites should infect humans, not infect elephants or not infect orangutan. But what happened when the environment changed, when there is no border between human and orangutan, between us and the wildlife? This is the phylogenetic tree that we actually uh, studied. We identified that from 19 orangutan's malaria parasite, we have the falciparum type down there. Falciparum is the human malaria parasite. So the malaria type parasite might be the knowledge, which is parasite for orangutan. But the first parum type is human type. So we need to study further about that. Interestingly, there are but six reports of the host jumping. Plasmodium nolesi is a parasite, malaria parasite that should infect orangutans. But here, the first one, naturally acquired human plasmodium nolesi infection in Singapore. There is one individual uh, who actually uh, deployed or in one of the natural reserves here uh, have trained and back with fever. When the check form plasmodium, it's not, it is parasite, it is plasmodium, but it's not for malaria, human <coughs> parasite. So uh, further study then could detect that the plasmodium nolasi was actually being detected in the blood of that person. Why? He has been exposed to the long tail monkey in that uh, natural reserve. In the Philippines, so since 2008, there are several reports already. Uh, reporting the presence of the orangutan malaria parasite in humans. From Malaysia Borneo, which is a Swedish traveler visiting Malaysian Borneo, uh, Indonesian Borneo as well, and uh, travel, travelers from Spain who travel to Southeast Asia. Because Vietnam also reported the presence of that kind of orangutan parasite. So this is the uh, relationship 
between animal and human. Animal to should infect animal, but now zoonosis from, from animal to human. And anthroponosis, which is very rare, that human to human to animal. This kind of thing could happen and happening uh, due to many environmental changes that we actually hear. What about elephants? If you think that because we are very close to orangutan or chimpanzee, doesn't mean that it is not jump to also from elephant to human. So three elephants have TB, and the elephant handler uh, cultured for TB and has similar strain with the fourth elephant that suffered from TB. So indicates that there is a transmission of bacteria between human and elephant. This thing in Indonesia. Media coverage on Ebola in Asian flu. Ebola virus found in Kalimantan's orangutan. That statement is very big. Because if you found that, what will happen to both to human and also to the uh, orangutan society? H1N9, eh, H1N1, and, and a pandemic on the duck. Without even, we have, without scientific background, there is a statement that uh, avian flu in duck is not mutation but man made. This one is in the, in the Indonesian media. You could actually expect what happened at that time. It was very big, creating panic to the society. And the National Intelligence Agency has to clarify that, that there is no such evidence <coughs> of bird flu bioterrorism. So if people do not know about biosafety, biosecurity, all of the biodefense, those kind of things, if they, if they don't know, uh, the National uh, Intelligence Agency do not know what the concept of that, uh, they might actually support it, the idea. Bioterrorism is an act of bioterrorists. It's more actually to create fear, to intimidate government or society. So if it is not clarified, you, you will know what happens. This is the Ebola virus, that's a distrib geographic distribution, so we are part of that bell. Actually, those statements resulting from this scientific report, that serological evidence of Ebola virus infection in Indonesian orangutan. So if you just take that, Ebola virus infection in Indonesia orangutan that will make your life different because meaning that you have the virus what they have is actually the antibody that those orangutan might be once infected by the virus or by the virus like Ebola like so that's what happened so communication uh, it's very important for biosecurity, biosafety uh, point of view. Uh, since we are working on those kind of emerging and re-emerging diseases, we have kind of like a, a goal that whatever that we do is towards one health. Capacity building, in identification, and surveillance through emerging pandemic set program from animal study, pathogen inspection, capacity building, coordination with the National Committee of Zoonosis and related government partners, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Forestry, Ministry of Health, and also Ministry of Trade and Industry, because they are the ones who actually gave a permit for import of animals. For a human study, to detect new and known zoonotic pathogens as well, and to improve diagnostic and treatment protocols. Wildlife surveillance and a very 
interface. This is web market. This is web. Bad dog. Those kind of things. Six. So the most important thing I think from our point of view is building culture of responsibility. So biosecurity in Indonesia we understand it's a multi-sector issue with unique priorities and challenges. So it is coordination between all of ministerials, foreign affairs, health, uh, agriculture, science and technology, uh, trade and industry, defense and private sector. It's a challenge because we don't know where we are now. We still conscious competent or conscious incompetent or unconscious but competent. So it's culture. So having said that, having presenting the <coughs> research, the activity, the molecular approach, what to offer to complexity science? Can we offer something? What about the population dynamics of emerging pathogens? What about answering the question whether about the emergence due to atrogenic change, emergence of pathogen in introduced species, emergence of potential human pathogen from transportation of wildlife pathogen. So there are a lot of topics that this kind of study that I presented is could be used for a complexity research. A second favorite example about the environment and social influences on emerging infectious diseases, past, present, and future. I heard that complexity is the future. Well, that's about travel and trade, about land use and environmental change, because there are a lot of diseases which actually could fit into whatever all of the topics that I presented. So with that, I would like to say thank you for your kind of So let's come to questions and remarks. I see your hands there. Yeah, please. Um, so what I understand is that um, actually we all are bioterrorists. Oh, I always had that idea about you. <laughs> yeah. No, not speaking myself. Oh. Uh, so, no, I'm just speaking myself. So, so we all are bioterrorists, right? Because we, we make sure that the palm oil plantations are there. Uh, because of that, we get the connection between the oil and the uh, and, um, uh, and, and because of that, we get uh, actually the Udang becomes a vector for the transmission of, of all kinds of viruses and whatever, or the, or the elephant. So the question I have is the following. Um, that doesn't help. If you want to make a, if you want to do policy, and if you want to actually avoid this problem, it doesn't help just, con just um, mentioning this issue. That it, because then the next step of the policy maker would be, okay, just get rid of all the orang utangs and uh, you don't have to commit, you have the factor, the factor is gone, and then your remark about that the orang utangs or the, the, the elephants are actually a pest is actually true. In their, in their opinion, that is actually true. So what we need to do, if we want to do, if we want to do conservation or, per, per, or, or preservation, whatever, what we need to do is to show that we need them. And and how much of them need to be there in order to get a sustainable uh, uh, ecosystem? Now, your, uh, you know, your, your monoclonal an antibody uh, monitoring and your phylogenetic trees can help, maybe can help to give us an impression of how many of these animals we actually need to have a sustainable, uh, you know, society of these animals. But the the real problem is, how can we um, convince the government? that we need these other organisms on our planet. If we don't, if we don't, if you're not convincing there, we might as well stop, because then, then it will be clear. The, the message will be, it's a pest, so let's get rid of them. Can you try to answer this question? Yes, sure. Uh, I don't think we are bioterrorists, because bioterrorists is actually trying to uh, make people actually hear about this kind of thing. But there is an intention, intention of making, or, yeah. Yeah, to create fear. To create panic yeah. in a society. But, uh, how are we going to actually tell the government in terms of uh, sustainability on, uh, uh, about those wildlife? 
Well, uh, it's, it's a never-ending uh, activity in ever. Uh, you know, I think you know about that. But so far, uh, at least uh, in Indonesia, the molecular genetic study was not being used. Uh, what is it? Not being really used to present uh, the result to the authority. So uh, by having that Ebola there uh, in the media, the Ministry of Forestry understand that they couldn't just take whatever it is, and they ask us, the scientists, to tell them what it is all about, what is the uh, reason behind those uh, media uh, frenzy, and uh, how are we going to deal with that? Because the National Committee Zoonosis have to react, have to respond to that until they are actually uh, the authority giving that statement, people still actually do not sure about how the government or authority going to handle that. That's, uh, I think, first. And also about the, whether all of the wildlife is actually important for the environment, for us, because that's what people are afraid of. And the Ministry of Forestry was aware of that if the orangutan has the Ebola virus, you will know what happened to them. Yeah. You will actually wipe out. I just want to make a comment, actually, which is <clears throat> back to my theme of the urgency of this. The, the Ebola article that, that uh, Hera mentioned that was published in PLOS One, and it happens to be wrong, but it said that orangutans are carriers of Ebola, and that goes in the media. If, that hadn't, if it hadn't been corrected quickly, they would probably be extinct, yeah. right? They would have, they would, we were that close, right? Yeah. A little bit of bad science. Among other things, Hera is in charge of the, she has a biosafety level three lab, the one in Indonesia, at her Ekman Institute, which she runs, by the way. You, could you say a word about the avian flu? Because that's also, when, when the avian flu is discovered in, in, in Indonesia, people go in, in in moon suits, right, to, to go investigate it. But Hera doesn't, she's in charge, right? She doesn't wear the moon suit. Why do you not wear the moon suit when you go in when they've discovered avian flu, Hera, in the cases of outbreaks? Well, uh, the biosafety laboratory level three, so that's why I mentioned about biosafety and biosecurity because you have to have that concept first, biosafety, working safe for uh, you working with highly pathogenic uh, um, agents. So working with that, you have to have a facility that when you can actually culture the agents. And by doing so, you can actually, uh, like I said, uh, like I uh, showed that you can uh, check for the DNA sequence that if there is a change, nucleotide change, that might lead to uh, affecting um, or might lead to a pandemic or a different uh, infecting a different kind of host, then uh, actually it's meaningful. So unless you if you don't have that facility, you cannot do anything about it. Okay. Yes. You want to say something? I just want to say, actually, yes, that's all. I just wanted to read. She doesn't wear a moon suit when she goes into these sites where, the, where, where avian flu has been suspected or discovered. And the reason is, imagine what happens to a community yeah. after, that, yeah. so after the moon suits have been in yeah. and the people have been isolated, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, that's in, in a not Sumatra actually, and they they are very. I mean, the village was affected by uh, the stigma. So yeah. people, it's a stigma. Yeah. So nobody actually want to have their children actually yeah. to go to school. Yeah. They were expelled from school because they don't know about how to handle that yeah. kind of a virus. 
So uh, that's why uh, it is an anthropological approach, I think, to be make make people human, right? Yeah. Not by actually you're having those suits or going to yeah. and the rest is like yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's clear. Yeah. Please. When when you discuss the the you know the list of diseases that were prevalent in Indonesia, that you identified the fact that there was such a high genetic diversity amongst the population as a problem, whereas according to the same logic, that would seem so to be a good thing because yeah. you have a you have a more resilient population, and yeah. etc. But so I was just curious yeah. in the context of this whole discussion why you identified it that way. Okay. Uh, as mentioned that Indonesia is very uh, diverse. So we have, we are um, already studying about 120 ethnic population in Indonesia, right? By doing so, we screen them for certain type of disease, for screening. It's, it's kind of like, a, because it's part of the health examination. Say, for example, hepatitis B. You screen them. When you do the genotyping of that people, it's healthy, uh, supposed to be healthy individuals, you found they harbor several uh, different type of uh, virus genotype. So we can actually look at the population structure of Indonesia, which is divided into Western Indonesia, uh, uh, central, which is uh, Wallace, uh, eastern, east of Wallace Line, and also the Papuan and Alor uh, population, they have different kind of subtype of viral. Also happen in dengue. So if you actually produce a vaccine, and it is not Taking the the general or universal part of that, it will fail. Yeah. So once I, yeah, no, I, I, I understand. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. No, I understand. But it's a it's a it's a classic resilience trade-off, right? In a sense, you have a population that, uh, on the face of it, would be more resilient to to a disease outbreak because the same virus doesn't spread that easily. But yeah, the, the industrial solution of the of the inoculation becomes harder. Is, is that yeah. a fair? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. the story. Yeah? Yeah. 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 Okay. Next one. Next one. Remarks, please. Uh, I'm Kevin Shaw from uh, uh, School of Triple E and TU. So I uh, just now I used uh, my mobile phone to do a little bit. Uh, search and then I found that back to 2003, it seems like the number of infections uh, by SARS in Indonesia was quite small. I mean, compared to the case in Singapore. So, uh, but I'm just wondering if next time Indonesia is uh, less lucky, touch wood. Okay, uh, say uh, in a country with more than 12,000 islands, uh, what would be the government's reaction uh, plan, I mean, how do you distribute the uh, medicine or vaccination, whatever, in, you know, in a country with 12,000, and do you have any plan for that? You're speaking about SARS. Yeah, because back to 2003, it yeah, seems okay, like Indonesia I, was doing yeah. very well, only a few yeah. cases, We're, right? You're talking but about SARS, uh, we uh, have I mean, SARS I, in Singapore, but we don't have it in Indonesia. I guess and only two cases according yeah, to my uh, yes. mobile phone, right? Yes. And it's, so, yeah. uh, but my question is like, if, uh, if next time we have uh, something, okay, and which somehow indeed uh, spreads out in Indonesia, in, in such a country with, uh, you know, so many islands, uh, how would the government try to react? I mean, I, I intuitively I feel like that would be extremely difficult. I think uh, it is like also in uh, other country, the first priority in terms of vaccination is always the children and the, uh, what is it, old age? The, uh, the elderly. Elderly, the elderly. And also how to cover the 12, uh, the, the whole Indonesia. 
We cannot do that, definitely. That's why I think uh, one thing that with avian flu, that uh, Indonesia is kind of like mm, very, uh, very uh, uh, cautious about that, that we cannot uh, even afford the, the avian flu. But what they do usually is uh, they have kind of like a limited uh, vaccination program for emerging uh, infection. But for others, say for example, the endemic uh, diseases such uh, hepatitis B, uh, it's the, because it's also maternally inherited, uh, they're giving it to babies. So it depends, actually, they react on the pro problem. Okay. Okay. Well, then, uh, once again, thank you very much. And we're going to the next question.